Hello, everybody. It is Women History Month here at Nerdbox, and we're celebrating every day on Facebook, and we'll have some interviews popping up along the month to celebrate not only women in the industry, but also some of our roots, because that's how Nerdbox was founded. We started out as Women in History. We wanted to focus on those strong women that were paving the way for other women and up-and-coming female actresses and directors and writers in the industry. So we have a special guest today. I'm sure you've seen the thumbnail. So, uh, Danny, how you been? Doing good. Doing good, everybody. What's going on? You know, just uh, traveling as always that we discussed before. Now, even more so than before, which is going to be great. But like I promised, getting back into the swing of things, just shot a short film in Atlanta, which was awesome. Um, planning on, you know, trying to get the YouTube channel back and rolling this year. So it's a lot of good stuff just prioritizing things so yep. i'm very excited what this year has to come yeah i'm excited for your uh announcement or upcoming news on the screen fan film if that happens yes. this year but i will say i just did a video for that and i went through a hundred plus screen fan films there's a lot out there all across the world it's crazy yeah yeah so we're excited so um me and my production partner were actually talking um we're trying to get that done as soon as possible. So right now we're in the uh, prep stages of uh, to see whether or not we actually have a budget on hand or we're gonna raise money for a bigger budget and whatnot because we decided to go bigger and better. You know, me and him are both visionaries. So what we had was great, was fantastic, but we're like, how could we be bigger and better? Like you said, there's a lot of uh, fan films out there. So we just wanna give the fans what they want right and it wouldn't be a scream film if it wasn't bigger and better mm -hmm. especially that we're trying to do things that have never been done before and uh also a lot of homages which dave i know you are a big easter egg fan so i know you're gonna enjoy that so we'll see we'll see how it goes if it, everything goes to plan it should happen this year and i think it's gonna be really really exciting especially with the whole new cast that my production partner wants to um put in into play and yeah uh, i'm super excited stay tuned for that so awesome awesome so this is the premiere episode of behind the mask where we're going to be talking with various actors and actresses or filmmakers in the industry and we'll dive into some of the behind the scenes to learn about their experiences in the industry and you know what advice they may be able to lend to others that are interested in breaking out into the industry as well so the last time danny and i were together we met with bill from the Terrifier crew and George Stuber as well. First ever interview with George Stuber, so it was great to hear them, so go check that out. And uh, let's dive into another Terrifier alum that is a lot more than just that. She's an actor, writer, filmmaker, TEDx speaker, stunt performer, animal activist. You may know her as the best fake out final girl that is jenna cannell she played terror and terrifier but she's worked across a variety of genres and mediums for years so let's bring her in lovely intro oh yeah yeah just seeing some of the stuff that you've done is just amazing so having you on this month to talk about all those things and not just talk about terrifier maybe we'll have a terrifier question but there's so much more that you've done that's inspirational thank you thanks so much no problem no problem so before we kick off things anything that you want to plug or talk about first sure i mean the biggest one which uh, i think we'll probably be coming back to this later but faceless after dark is currently on the festival circuit it's a meta horror slash dark comedy and i'm the lead actor and stunt performer in it but i also co-wrote it and i'm really really proud of it so that, that's uh it'll hopefully nice. be streaming later this year awesome awesome well we'll talk about definitely yeah shortly all right, so let's jump into some questions. So what led you into becoming an actor? I started out as a writer. I mean, before I could even write, before I was literate, I, I was always telling stories. I uh, spent a lot of time entertaining myself in corners and, um, and then started writing once I knew how. And then I 
got into film and theater in high school and I realized that, uh, that I really loved it and that it taught me a lot about being present and connecting with people even if we don't necessarily see eye to eye and I love working with a team towards a common goal and I love art and I think it has an important place in the culture or, or it can and uh, I feel that film has a responsibility to tell stories that our history books often don't and to reflect on our, our culture and our society and how we feel about each other and what we can learn and sometimes is just a catharsis and that's that's also something. So, yeah, uh, I, I love it and, and then have been, got into directing and stunt performing from that. And like you said, have kind of dabbled, have done some producing. I used to assist and direct a lot. Yeah, you often hear that with a, a lot of talented people. They start when they're younger, picking up whatever. You know, that's how I got into being an artist. Like before I can write, I was putting together those little picture yeah. books. Like in kindergarten, first grade and stuff like Absolutely. that. Yeah, that's awesome yeah thank story. you. And now I'm stuck. I don't know how to do anything. Yeah, else. it's it's. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that that's funny that you know we all have stories like yeah. that when we were younger, right? Like, uh, mine mine was imitating a lot of uh, TV stuff. My mother used to make me imitate Jim Carrey for people uh, all the time. I love Jim Carrey. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely one of my favorites. And um, even though I did, what's funny is I didn't grow up as a theater kid. I was a band geek. But my first plays were actually when I was in New York oh, cool. uh, in school, which is funny. Yeah, yeah. So um, it was funny. I remember one time we had to be animals in a zoo and I didn't have a bat costume. So I literally wore a Batman <laughs> costume. As That's a bat. very funny. I love that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then uh, because I talked a lot in class and all this, all this jazz, always getting in trouble for talking. They had me as a narrator for one play, yada, yada. But this is what I do for a living now. I talk to people. Ha-ha. So, ha-ha, there, there you go. go. Still wearing <laughs> the Batman costume to this day. <laughs> yes, exactly. I told you not to tell anyone Anytime. that, Jenna, you but thank you. You can edit it out That's later. Fine. That's not my problem. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you're good. <laughs> All right. So my question for you is, you know, as an actor, you have a very diverse portfolio. As Dave mentioned, a lot of talented people do. You know, you have music videos, short films, feature films, TV, et cetera. Is there one thing you enjoy doing more than others? No, I mean, I think it, it depends. I, there are a lot of things that are just fun in different sorts of ways. I think I love working on big budget stuff because then you can see how the machine works when there's an army behind it, you know? And then I love working on indie stuff when often there's, there's less time and fewer resources on the con side, but on the pro side, it's often more collaborative and there's more... Uh, room for creativity and and wiggle room for for problem solving so yeah I, just, I don't know i wouldn't i wouldn't want to pick i like bouncing around i get restless now i know you wouldn't want to pick but is there something that you lean towards a little bit that you prefer a little bit more being on the big set or being on the independent film sets where you have a little bit more flexibility I honestly, my, my dream has always been to be able to bounce back and forth between them because I, I love the stories that are being told in both of those worlds. And there's, like we were saying, different types of freedom in both arenas. But I, you know, I, I want to be able to, to tell the stories that really matter to me and maybe are sometimes not yet being told on a grand stage. But at the same time, I want health insurance. So <laughs> it's a, it's a, it's a fine, uh, it's a balance. It's a balancing act. And, uh, it's, it's one that I'm grateful to be, um, walking the tightrope of, so to speak. Now being a filmmaker, you made your debut with the short film yeah. Bumblebees, which hits close to home. Can you tell us a little bit about that film and what led you to switching roles? To yeah, I would be happy that? to. And, and afterwards I would love to hear about how it hit it's close to home that that makes me happy to hear bumblebees uh, is a short film that i made with my younger brother and it was my first time directing which is why you know when you go back and and watch it i'm i promise my production values have increased exponentially since then but it was it was very very indie at the time and we were just figuring things out it, i originally entered it for a 48 hour film competition and i'm sure you guys both know of those or have done them and i'm sure a lot of people who watch this have done them and if you haven't before i highly recommend it because it's basically you know you get a weekend 
you get a word, uh, you have to use this word, you have to use this prop, whatever line of dialogue. Uh, it has to be this genre. And then you have a weekend to churn out a film. And some people do different versions of this where like there's one in town in Atlanta here that's, uh, that's you get a week. But anyway, so I wanted to do it as a fun creative challenge. And my younger brother is uh, physically disabled and also neurodivergent. He's on the autism spectrum and has cerebral palsy and epilepsy and a number of things. And there is a 48 competition that's specifically for neurodivergent and physically disabled people. And I wanted to try it just to see and ask my brother if he'd be interested in, in entering it with me. And he said, yeah. And I originally was going to have someone else direct it. And kind of at the last minute, I decided to direct it myself because I figured, and this is why 48s are great. The stakes are so low. Like, what do I have to lose? I could only learn and get experience. And really, ultimately, it was a story that I wrote and that I knew my brother trusted me with, and that meant a lot and still does. So we decided to go for it, and it ended up playing all over the world at over 40 film festivals and like played at the CDC, and uh, we ended up speaking at Harvard Medical School alongside it, and I ended up doing a TEDx talk about it, which is on YouTube, and I, I would love for anyone to check out who's interested more about his story. One in 68 American children, mostly boys, are on the autism spectrum, one in 68. And thanks to these recent bursts in awareness, our film was accepted at or invited to over 30 film festivals around the world, winning a handful of awards in educational or socially driven content. And the more feedback we heard, the more we pushed our limits. <laughs> As I watched complete strangers fall in love with Vance on screen, I too watched him for what felt like the first time with fresh eyes without expectations. Not only did I newly value him, but this all forced me to dissect my relationship with film itself. It ended up doing really well and we ended up um, going a lot of places with it and, and it's been used in a lot of schools as a part of their curriculum, which makes me um, really happy. And uh, yeah, we're both really proud of, of what happened and that kind of is what introduced me to the world of production work. So after that I started started directing more regularly and like I said before assistant directing and producing and writing more and now I hop back and forth in front of and behind the camera yeah and there there needs to be more of a focus on that uh, you know me having worked in healthcare outside of YouTube you know I've seen those struggles heard those struggles you know the one organization I was with we had a center for people with disabilities for teenagers and kids where they can go and they can actually learn everyday skills. And, and, and where we had this building located, we had rooms dedicated for different things. Like, hey, this is a, a supermarket. That's oh, cool. We'll teach you how to shop and do all that stuff. Yeah. They had a driving uh, simulator too, so they can help them get their driver's licenses. So it was gr it's great to see people focus on those things. And yeah. Those out. Well, and um, I, you know, it's something where I was watching a lot of, uh, a lot of films that center around neurodivergence and disabilities and a lot of them are very dramatic and very heavy and almost make it feel like these things are a death sentence and I felt like there was something missing in terms of representation because all of us want to see ourselves on screen and all of us experience the same longing for understanding and belonging and love and you know I, I thought uh, there's a way to infuse comedy into this that's not at the expense of the person it's about and uh, and that was fun to kind of find and actually to, to plug this we ended up making another I mean I've directed something like 20 short projects since then but uh, we my brother and I made another film earlier or last year that will come out sometime this year that I'm really excited about called Spray Bottle and it has far more bells and whistles and I'm much more experienced now. So it's gonna be, it's a very, very different film. It's an action comedy. So there there's some fun stunts involved as well. So I'm, I'm excited for you all to see that one. What's that about? It's, uh, it's about a former stunt performer and uh, struggling basically as a caregiver for her brother. And it's about their worst day. And I don't want to give away anymore. more. Mm. Ooh, sounds yeah. interesting. And what's amazing is that, you know, you, you got a bunch of nominations for it. You also got one best film for it. Which yeah. Is cool. um, Thank you. But not only that, I think, I think what's uh, amazing for what you and Dave were saying is that, so when I used to teach martial arts, 
um, we had a young kid, and Ryan will tell you this too, that was also on uh, the bit of a spectrum, didn't talk, right, and whatnot. However, what was really cool is that he mimicked everything that he saw. So in class, it's like he was one of the best whenever punching and kicking because he did exactly what we were doing. So if I said one and I punched, he would punch. You know what I mean? But he was, was absorbing like, everything. Ugh. He was, was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And and that probably was really cathartic, I imagine, because he that's uh, martial arts. Because we were talking about this before that I've done that as well, and it's it's a form of expression. And especially if you're nonverbal, you know, it it, it probably feels so good. To, I mean, I feel great when I punch something. Let alone, you know, if I if I'm unable yeah. to express something. It's a, it's a way of getting that out. And that's, yep. that's so cool. I love that. Yeah, absolutely. Because, you know, it, it's funny because, you know, sometimes other children didn't understand. Right. And sometimes, you know, he could be a handful, but it's just when it was time for class, man, it was just, a, it was like, he was such a that's totally awesome. different kid. It was that's phenomenal. amazing. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, you also have your, uh, indie film company, yeah. right? So Laser Pigeon Productions, uh, LL, oh, yes. pictures, me, Laser Pigeon Pictures, LL, <laughs> uh, but you have produced, so yes. production, yes. right? <laughs> Over 40 films, with, uh, several of them winning awards just like this one. Uh, did that come about because of Bumblebees? Yes. Or what, what was like your initial? Yeah, thought? so I mean, company, it, it is legally a company, but it's a loose term because it's just, it's just me. Uh, but it's a, it's a sole proprietorship. So it's, <laughs> you're looking at the entire employee system here. Company parties are a ton of fun. I, I created it. Trust me, we're in the same boat. Sure. I understand. I think, and that's the <laughs> thing. I think a lot of people do that and on the indie level because you want to, you know, when I work as an actor and as a stunt performer, I'm protected under the, the union, under SAG-AFTRA. But when... Uh, it doesn't make sense for me to be in the union yet for filmmaking, with, you know, in the PGA or the DGA or the WGA quite yet. And so I wanted to create something that would protect my assets and protect my intellectual property just because I was creating things that were involving and employing other people. And so that's why I created it. And uh, yeah, at Laser Pigeon Pictures, it, the name com is actually an homage to Nikola Tesla, uh, who is the... Yes, oh. who, uh, if you don't know, uh, don't believe what you've read, he was the inventor of the light bulbs that we use. Um, and uh, among, like, he helped contribute to, to a lot of other research, like Wi-Fi, sustainable energy. But he, when he was dying alone and poor on his deathbed, because that asshole Edison, I don't know if I'm allowed to swear on this, that asshole Edison had stole, stolen all his money. Um, and he, Tesla was like losing his mind and he loved pigeons. He loved the company of pigeons because he was kind of a, a weirdo and a recluse, like a lot of artistic people are, I think. And this one of his, he wrote in his journal that one of his favorite pigeons came and landed on his windowsill. And he was like, had so out of his, out of it that he said he saw her shoot lasers out of her eyes. So that's where the name comes from. Oh, <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Uh, either either he was on some right. good psychedelics or the <laughs> conspiracy theory is real. Pigeons it's, aren't real. It could really right? go either way. <laughs> he was either had a bad and was hallucinating, had eaten some funky fungus and was hallucinating, or birds aren't real. <laughs> no. Yeah, I, I'm dying for the day to see one frozen in the air, not flying. <laughs> like I've seen it before. <laughs> Your time might come. Like yeah. the Matrix. <laughs> Oh man, that, well, that's cool. That's cool. So what, what made you want to produce more? I know you said that these things inspired yeah. you to direct more and stuff, but what inspired you to do that? And also, um, I, I like to do this on our show a lot, um, for people that were in your position that they don't know where to start. How can someone build a production company like you started doing? Yeah, I, okay, so to answer the first question, I started working in other areas behind the camera because I wanted to, once I realized that I really did enjoy directing and was good at it, I wanted to learn more about how to do it because, well, I wanted to learn more about how to do it and how and how the machine works behind the camera. And so that's why I started producing more and, and why I started assistant directing. And especially assistant directing is something that I did a ton of for years and was my primary source of income for, for a moment excuse me, on like features and, and shorts and pilots, music videos, you name it. And I learned a lot about 
how a schedule is built, how a schedule is kept, about why a schedule looks the way it does, about how things happen, about how to communicate with every department, about how long things realistically take and what are the things that need to, you know, the ripple effects that need to happen in order for everything to, to align. And that was immensely helpful as a director who is, you know, the masthead of communicating with every department about what's in their head and turning something intangible into something very real. And and also it's even helped me as a writer because when I'm writing things that I know I want to make, I'm writing things that, you know, uh, I know I can logistically accomplish and I can see how they would be done because something I learned so much about directing from assistant directing because I mean it's funny because the typical path of people who assistant direct they typically become producers which makes a lot of sense but for me I found that I learned a lot by working with different directors and a lot of directors a lot of green newer directors didn't necessarily for example have a sense of their edit and that led to really slow shoot days because they'd be getting a ton of coverage that they didn't necessarily know if they needed or what parts they'd be using it for. And it just goes to show that, you know, you plan for a post in pre-production. And like they say, one of my favorite sayings in film is all mistakes are made in pre-production. And it's really true. And I never learned that more than when I was assisting other directors and trying to help them get their, get their visions off the ground. So I learned a ton. And then the thing I would say to other people because, uh, you know, I, I get company is such a funny word, like it, tech, legally it's true, <laughs> but it's more, you know, I work with other companies a lot and, and, and might actually be uh, joining another one at some point uh, in the filmmaking capacity this year. I'm having some interesting conversations about that. But something that I would say to anyone who's interested in just filmmaking in general is that I recommend everyone do at least a little bit of extra work and everyone do at least a little bit of production assistant work. And especially like all actors should do extra work and all anyone in any form of production should do should be a PA at some point because it's you're at the bottom of the totem pole. You're getting treated the worst, but as a result, you also have the least responsibility. Again, the stakes are the lowest and it's a it's a position from where you can watch everything and absorb everything you're seeing and see what's working and what isn't and how how again the whole machine runs and how the train actually leaves the station without crashing. So I, I highly recommend people do that because, and, and then also to work as you work your way up to work as many departments as you can, because something I also found when producing and assistant directing for other directors is that the ones that were the hardest for me to work with were the ones that had only ever directed or only ever been a department head because they didn't know the ways and you, I'm you probably have seen this with other actors too of like actors who have only ever acted don't understand like how small of a piece of the puzzle you are and how like everything can move you're we're all very easily replaceable everything can move without us they'll just get somebody else and and how much everything ripples outwards and why everything is set up the way it is like I would have actors say like, well, I was waiting around yesterday, so I, I'm not going to, I'm going to come later than my call time. And it's like, well, no, because your call time is this way for a certain, there's like, it's because this is happening and this is happening and like X, Y, Z. And I think the, the people that are the most fun to work with are the ones who have a sense of the entire picture and how we really need every single one of these people. Like everyone on a set is necessary and knows what they're doing in their lane and, and has to be trusted and communicated with and given the tools to succeed. And I love working with people that have a sense of, of the whole, you know, and which is, I think, also true about humanity. I think it's, you know, there is no such thing as individualism. It's an American myth. Like, we all need to think and, and work as a community because that's when magic happens. That's a great way to summarize it up just life yeah. in yeah. general too and, and the other aspects yeah. of it too the, yeah, the trend yeah. Is perfect. Thank you. yeah and to, to piggyback one last question for for those that are brand yeah. new like i said i always do this when it comes to new people so you said start mm -hmm. as a pa fantastic i agree yeah start from the bottom how because some people are afraid to talk to directors assistant directors and stuff because i remember uh, when I first started doing extra work and stuff like that, they're like, oh, no, 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 you don't, you don't go next to them. <laughs> don't they're look like, them in the eye. Them it's like a predator. <laughs> yeah. 
yeah yeah <laughs> and so you, you hear this and so you know me despite that i still went right and still talked to people and treated them like normal and they accepted me which was great but what would you suggest for people that are afraid that they're just a pa to talk to people what would your advice be it is dicey because there are circumstances where it's a bad time to talk to someone or it's it is someone who who might freak out at you um and you don't you certainly don't want to get fired or step on toes i think it depends on some of it is just reading the room of like if everything's in crisis if like you're running behind and and things are falling apart or on fire not a good time to network with anybody but you know if you're sitting down for lunch if you're like you know waiting for something and people seem relatively low stress that's maybe a better time to talk to 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 people um and also your like the your department head is going to be the person that hires you on the next job and that person's always great to to talk to and communicate with or even i've seen like someone is paing just as a general pa to production but they really want to be in camera department and so they like go over and like talk to you know the second ac or the first ac or like someone who's not constantly having all this pressure on them about their experience and about like oh i'd love to pa like specifically for camera department like what's the best way to do that i think it also depends on you know it's not always the talking that happens while you're there uh it's also you know going to networking events you know looking up uh there there are facebook groups and and instagram pages and i'm sure i'm not on linkedin but i'm sure linkedin has something similar there are you know groups of like film production LA film production Atlanta film production New York film production like sometimes people will post jobs there sometimes you, there are meetups where you can talk to other people who are in your your network or your market and just network as much as you can meet everybody that you can and but definitely you know um be smart about when you do it because sometimes if you do talk to someone at the wrong time it can go very wrong so you just want to kind of read the room and and be selective about when and how you do that. But they're also and also like doing workshops, you know, uh I I be smart about your money obviously, do research, don't get ripped off, but there are definitely ways to meet people and to and to network for sure. And you just have to keep doing it and the more you do it, the better at it you get. There you go, folks, Jenna dropping bombs. <laughs> that one's on the house. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I think you've done a lot of this stuff already talking about it, but with Laser Pigeon Pictures, so two of the goals is about empowerment and education of film. So, you know, how do you go about that? Sure, I mean, I, I put that up partially because uh, some of the work that I've done behind the camera has been on the documentary or fundraising side. Um, and I love stuff like that because I think there are a lot of organizations and groups that are doing really meaningful work but because they're not necessarily artists they don't know how to communicate what they're doing to the public and explain why it's so important and i think that's kind of where we can come in and where i i like to come in sometimes when i'm not doing and even it's true about narrative work too i think a lot of art whether it's you know uh even if it's not seemingly educational i think you're saying something with your art regardless of whether you want to or not it's what you're saying or what you're not saying right and so i think uh i think that's a that's a responsibility i think there's some responsibility that comes with that and it's a a great platform to you know communicate a message or help someone else communicate a message and uh but but it can also be in much more subtle ways like something that's really important to me every time i'm directing or producing or behind the camera is hiring like i it's really important to me to have an inclusive team that there should be like There should be queer people on the team. There should be women on the team. There should be uh, you know, non-binary people, global majority people, like it should be racially diverse and inclusive and again, like I said before, all those people should be given the tools that they need to actually succeed and and actually listened to because just I've I've been hired on jobs behind the camera where I'm clearly just they're like a woman, look, it's a, we did it, but then I wasn't listened to in any way or respected and then it's like why am I even fucking like this is, you know. So you actually have to it's not just hiring inclusively so you can take a, you know, performative photo about how uh woke you are. It's about actually like involving people in the process because it's better that way because we all have different perspectives and we all have something 
to offer in terms of our experience and where we come from. And so that's, that's really, that's all really important to me. I think it's so funny when people say um, that their work is, or their art is not political because the hill that I will die on is that that doesn't exist. I believe everything is political. There's no such thing as not being political. Because again, it's either what you're saying or what you're not saying, you know? Uh, in, in it's It could be like just how it's written, who you cast, the way it's shot, everything is, is a statement. So it's a matter of uh, what, you're, what you actually are trying to say. Yeah, I was going to say, I would imagine it's a tough balance too, because you're, you're pushing forward for yourself and then trying to open the door for yeah. others behind you. It's always, I noticed it's always yeah, a tough balance. Yeah, but I, that's a really good way of putting it. That's a really good visual. Obviously, you know, put on your mask, oxygen mask first before putting it on anybody else. But, but once you have, because I've had people help me and I'm, I'm so grateful for the doors that have been opened for me or, or the people that haven't stopped me from kicking them in myself. But then similarly, yeah, I think that there are opportunities to open them for other people as well. Not for everyone necessarily, but like the people that you trust and believe in. There you do you know from the synopsis is that one of the fans like breaks into my home dressed as the as the clown from the movie. And you'll see how that goes for them once you watch it. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, I haven't plugged this yet gonna be in bad boys 4 comes out this summer <laughs> Hi. Nice. so yeah um, and uh it's it's gonna be it's gonna be fun and that one's just you know as you know straight action movie comedy action uh do 